We've known about your church for a number of years. I can't, how many years has it been since you joined us in the EPC? Six years. So for six, seven years, I've been hearing about you all. And for six, seven years, I had a new colleague. And uh, through a book study group that we have that we both participate in somewhat regularly, I'm the somewhat, he's regular. <laughs> um, I've gotten to know your pastor. And so uh, outside of the scope of the... Uh, the sermon that has been prepared, I wanted to just open with a reading from, Col from uh, the, Col the Colossian letter. And this is my heart to you. And this is what came to my mind when I think about you and all that I've heard about you as a congregation over these years. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. Because we have heard of your faith. We have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love that you have for all the saints. The faith and love that spring forth from the hope that is stored up for you in heaven and you have already heard about in the word of truth and the gospel that has come to you. All over the world, the gospel is bearing fruit and is growing. Just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard of it and understood God's grace and truth. I just want you to know that your reputation in our presbytery is strong. The work that you do with Young Life, the work that you do within your town, the work that you do with so many others, the, the open arms that you have to welcoming in all sorts of, of, of people with all sorts of ideas. You don't have lit, litmus tests to bring people in other than Jesus is Lord. And if they don't know that, you welcome them with love. That is your reputation. And so thank you for that. I was reminded that apparently this week was a, a Sunday after an election. I'm not sure if you know that. <laughs> Tracy wanted me to remember that. <laughs> so I'm going to let you know that everything that I have um, written and thought and brought to you has been created before and thought and written before the election occurred. So there's nothing that has been added or, or tweaked to respond to what has occurred. I've also gone and helped out. Um, my, my goal was to let some pastors know, hey, if you're tired, if you need a week or whatever, for whatever reason, I have some availability before my work doesn't allow me to travel. I thought a couple people might take me up on it. I've been on the road every week for a month. <laughs> so I've had the chance to practice this sermon a few times too. So it better be a little better for you at this point. But everything I have here for you this morning is from the heart and from the scriptures. And I think is appropriate for today, but isn't because of today. So with that in mind, will you indulge me in looking into this letter from Corinthians and a little bit of the words of Jesus as well. Now, before I go into this passage about love, which is so famous and so popular and so wonderful, and um, there's been so many like posters with kittens and Bibles and flowers made with these verses on them. Now, every other time I've given this sermon, my wife wasn't in the room. She's here today. I always led with this story about her. I did not gain approval or permission for this story. So let's go. <laughs> 17 years ago, we got married. I, and I don't want you to think I'm a deadbeat um, fiance. I was involved in a lot of it. I was really heavy into the liturgy of the service. I was involved with a lot of the things. There was one aspect for certain that I cared zero about. It was the wedding invitation. As long as it said, like, hey, you, come here at this time. That's all I cared. That, it didn't matter to me. It could have been like a post-it note for all I cared. Except then I came to one thing. I said, please, don't pick 1 Corinthians 13. It's so cliche. It's so overdone. It's so, uh, please. Well, my wife, is, has, she's a spiritual gift. It's, it's, um. There's other words for it, but she can, she can save money well. And doesn't like to spend money on frivolous things. So she came back and said, oh, we have a nice little wedding invitation. It's in gold. I prefer silver, but gold's fine. And right on the cover, you will not guess what was written across the entire thing. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love doesn't envy. First Corinthians 13, really? And she said it was the cheapest. But so that's one, of the con that's one of the backdrops that we have when we 
take a look at this scripture passage, we almost always find it used in some moment of the, one of the happiest days in people's lives. And also one of the most unrealistic days in people's lives, right? The wedding day when nothing can go wrong. And then afterwards when you learn to live with each other as sinners in need of a savior. Love is patient. We could stop right there. That's a life's work. Love is kind. Do we have to? It doesn't envy. Well, I rarely envy except those times when I do. It doesn't boast. It's not proud. I think we want to impart to all of our children that love does not dishonor others. We don't disrespect those around us. That's not a way you treat other human beings, is it? That's not loving. It's not self-seeking. It's patient and not easily angered. Oh, here's one for, for the, for the, if you're going to choose this for your wedding vows and, and, and invitation, love keeps no record of wrongs. Yeah, write that down, everyone. Go back, look in. Apologize as much as you need to afterward. Love keeps no record of wrongs. My children are thinking like, oh, really? Let's write this down. It doesn't delight in evil, but it rejoices in truth. Like, see, love always protects. Love always trusts. Love always hopes. Love always perseveres. Love never fails. Praise God. Pass the plate. We're good. Except the problem is, we're people. And love sounds good to talk about. And love sounds good when it's easy. But love is so much more difficult when people don't want to be loving or loved. Or when people are tired of love and they want action. Oh, they're tired of all this patience and love and they just can't bring themselves to love anymore when what they really need is action. And like, wait, when did we, when did love stop being active? When did love stop being transformative? When did love stop being the, what the world needs now? Sorry if I just put a song in your head. <laughs> That's actually a sorry, not sorry. I really meant to. I'm going to quote, um, uh, Richard Rohr is a wonderful Catholic who makes everybody mad on his side and our side at a lot of times, so I think he's someone you should listen to often. Richard Rohr said, Christianity is a lifestyle. It's a way of being in the world that is simple, nonviolent, shared, and loving. However, we made, it into an, we made it into an established religion and avoided the lifestyle change itself. One can be warlike, greedy, racist, selfish, and vain, and still believe that Jesus is one's personal Lord and Savior. He continues to say, the world has no time for such silliness anymore. The suffering on earth is too great. So in light of what we've had this week, I've come to realize that no matter what or whom or how the election turned out, there's still a 50-50 hateful divide of just pain and sadness and not to be glib but silliness. We find everything that we can do to divide ourselves over and against each other. Now, if you ever go back, and most of you don't know me, and you probably haven't had the chance to do this, nor should you probably, because it's really not worth your time. But if you went to do a Google search on me, you would find out that I'm not one of those middle-of-the-road silent pastors that you always just have to wonder and guess who they voted for. I'm kind of flagrant. But I found this week the people on my side weren't happy enough with me. You see, because I, I work for an office with a bunch of people who have various ideas. A couple of us are vocal. We have a nice little friendly wager in the fa in, in the, inside the, uh, the office. One of us is going to get a pie in the face. That's going to be fun. Just for everybody, because it's fun. I posted a picture of me and my friend. We vote differently than each other. But I said one of the beautiful things is that we can still be friends and move on, and I got lit up for that. And it, just read my, it's not, I don't care that I had people say mean and nasty things. It just re-reminded me again that it doesn't matter what side you're on. If you have not love, you make noise. 
no matter what side you're on, if you don't have love, you are just part of a, a, a deeper problem than whatever policy you care most about. And these policies matter. And they do have impact. And they do affect our lives, some more personally than others. And I don't want to downplay that. And I do know that sometimes if you think that if you vote for one, you're, you're upholding this evil. And if you vote for the other, you're upholding that evil. But the reality is, if we have not love and cannot see the humanity of our neighbor, we have lost that which we are fighting for. Christianity is a lifestyle. It's a way of being in the world that is simple and nonviolent, shared and loving. But it's not when we make it an established religion that does not require transformation, that does not require change, because then we can just sanctify our war, like sanctify our greed, sanctify our racism, sanctify our selfishness, sanctify our vanity with just a brush of Jesus as Lord and Savior. If Jesus is Lord, if you have Jesus as King, we honor, we worship, we bow down, and we obey. We abide, we remain, we seek to put on the Jesus way. And let me just tell you, friends, if my week has been any indication of what authentic Jesus following looks like, and it may or may not, I don't think so, I don't know, we'll see. But authentically following Jesus seems to make everybody mad at you at some point or another. Are we willing to love even when that love is not reciprocated? Are we willing to love? Are we willing to be patient when people want rashness? Are we willing to be kind when maybe those don't deserve kindness? Are we willing to fight against envying and boasting and arrogance? Are we willing to not participate or condone or honor the dishonoring of others? Are we others seeking are we not easily angered? Do we try to eradicate? You know, Jesus for, said that in the psalmist, the psalmist said that our sins are forgiven like as far as the east is from the west. Do we strive to participate in that? So I wanted to jump right into how we can take a look at this love in a context of a, of a contextualized moment, in real, this love in real life. And I go to go to the words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 5. He said, you have heard it was said, Love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be the children of your Father in heaven. You've heard that, right? Jesus says, love your enemies. Again, super easy for me to say up in front of you right now. You're a very sympathetic audience. We all kind of have some similar agreements. Even easier to say to you all because you're not even in the room. Fantastic. I can say anything I want. But it's a lot harder to love our enemies when they're pushing back, when they say mean things publicly, when they stop talking to you, when they've written you out of their lives. So Jesus said, you've heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemies. Now, that's interesting because we know that that comes from that loving your neighbor is the second greatest commandment, right? If you know Jesus, he was asked. Trying to, they were trying to trick him and trying to trap him. And they said, what's the greatest commandment? And he said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. And then he goes on to like add an answer to the question that he wasn't asked. He said, and the second is, love your neighbor as yourself. It comes from Leviticus 19. He said, the, the whole of the law and the prophets hinges on those two commandments. If you can love God and love your neighbor, you've got it. You've grasped it. It's not how easy it is. It's how complete those two things are. Right? So let's take a look at Leviticus. Common Sunday practice. Leviticus 19. When you reap the harvest of your land, do not reap at the very edges of your field or gather the gleanings of your harvest. Do not go over your vineyard a second time and pick up the grapes that have fallen. Leave them for the poor and the foreigner. I am the Lord your God. Do not steal. Do not lie. Do not deceive one another. Do not swear falsely by my name and so profane the name of your God. I am the Lord. Do not defraud or rob your neighbor. Do not hold back the wages of a hired worker overnight. Do not curse the deaf or put a stumbling block in front of the blind, but fear your God. I am the Lord. 
do not pervert justice. Do not show partiality to the poor or favoritism to the, to the great, but judge your neighbor fairly. Do not go about spreading slander among your people. Do not do anything that endangers your neighbor's life. I am the Lord. Do not hate a fellow Israelite in your heart. Rebuke your neighbor frankly so you will not share in their guilt. Do not seek revenge or bear grudge against anyone among your people, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. You get a real sense of the ideals of fairness, of how we treat one another, of how we don't show partiality, of how we treat one another economically, socially, politically, uh, judicially. You get this idea that how we are supposed to live with one another, and it's culminated with love your neighbor as yourself. But I want to take a moment here and recognize that Jesus' day, he said, you have heard, love your neighbor, hate your enemy. But Leviticus says, love your neighbor. How did we get that second part? Where did that come from? Well, apparently what was common, what did resonate with the people who were listening to Jesus was love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Where did they get that from? How could they find that? Well, there is one thing. In verse 17, it says, do not hate a fellow Israelite. Do not hate them in your heart and treat them fairly. Do not hate a neighbor. So then that always leads us to the great question. Who, who is my neighbor, right? Now, before we skip ahead to finding out, remembering how Jesus answered, who's my neighbor? Don't cheat the sermon. Let it flow. How do we decide who is our neighbor? How do we decide who is, and, and before we even decide how do we decide who is our neighbor, what are the consequences of being a neighbor? You see, when someone is a neighbor, we have to see them. We have to know them. We have to acknowledge them as humans. When someone becomes less than a neighbor, they become less than a human. That's my, I'm going to assert that. When you take someone and they become not fully someone you have to embrace, they become less than human. They become someone you can disregard. They become someone you are not obligated to. They become someone you can ignore or be dismissive towards. They become someone that you don't have to be patient with or kind to. Maybe they can become someone you can envy or brag to or be arrogant towards. They, they fall into the category of people that you're allowed to dishonor because, you know, they are one of those voters. They are from that town. They do root for the cowboys. I want to make sure it was very clear that we understood what is evil in this world, or at least confused. You see, we, whatever it is that we divide over and we choose, it is amazing, literally, and, and I, we jest, we l joke there a little bit, it's amazing to see how many people actually dehumanize people who root for the opposite team. Really? It's amazing how much we dehumanize someone who votes for a candidate that we don't like. Really? Who comes from a socioeconomic class that we are not from. who has a, a, a racial pigmentation that looks different than the one that we were raised with. All these different ways that we can break things down into us's and them's. Well, they break it down. There's a friend of mine from seminary. He wrote a book, and this is a quote from it. He just recently was just recently published. Jared said, I don't need to know what you believe or how you live your life to know it's my responsibility as a follower of Jesus to love you in such a way that others wouldn't know whether you're one of my people or my enemy. I'm going to read that again. I don't need to know what you believe or how you live to know that it is my responsibility as a follower of Jesus to love you in such a way that others wouldn't know whether you are one of my people or my enemy. You see, when God is involved, the line between us and them gets erased. And we're not called to this because of our great humanitarian nature. We're not called to this because deep down inside, they're really a good person. They might really be awful. Let's be honest, they might. 
we are called to this because Jesus called us to this because this is how Jesus loved us. He loved his enemy. So you heard that it was said, love your neighbor, hate your enemy. But I say love your enemies and pray for those who are persecuted. And this does not mean feel amorous. This does not mean feel f- warm and fuzzy or have affection towards. You might still see said person that you've chosen to love and really not want to run into them in the grocery store. You may still want to like, oh, I'll, I'll say hello real quickly and walk on by. Or, oh, I, just because you're not loving your enemy doesn't mean you have to engage them in social media. Probably is better. The best love you can do is probably not engage them in social media. But loving your enemy, what then does it mean? It means to will good for them. It means to will good and peace and shal- the shalom of God, the peace of God, the wholeness, the healing, the fullness of God. It's to wish blessing upon them, and when you have opportunity to do so, to take action to bless them. And when you don't have opportunity to do so, pray for them. That's what this means. You see, if you only love those who love you, what reward do you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? If you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Even the non-Christians do that. And then he wraps this up. He says, be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly father is perfect. Super great. Thanks, Jesus. <laughs> now, here's the funny thing. I grew up in a world where perfection and holiness were equated to morality, okay? Now, if I'm ever invited back, I'll, I'll, I'll spend the second sermon on this one, is looking into how, how holiness is mission, not moral perfection, okay? But, but just bear with me on this one. It's, it seems difficult to have Jesus wrap up this section and say, be perfect as God is perfect, when he starts this whole thing by saying, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who understand their need and and mourn over their sin and their placement, and they will be comforted. How do we get this idea that you're blessed for being broken and acknowledging your brokenness, now go be perfect? Recently, I heard somebody commentate on this, and I think that they're right. They said, instead of um, wrapping our mind around an epistemic idea of perfection and a moralistic idea of perfection, why don't we think of it as be mature and complete? Let your love become mature. Let your love become complete, just as your father's love is mature and complete towards you. Is that helpful? Because every other time I thought of the perfection, I was like, well, lost that again. But I can strive towards maturity in my love. I can strive towards maturity in the way I treat those that I really don't want to be nice to. The same person who unlocked this passage for me, he says one of the things he tries to do, and I've I've been trying to do this, but I haven't really done it yet, but uh, fully, is, is take the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. Take that and use that as a template for reading and prayer. Pray through Matthew 5, 6, and 7, and pray through those passages to help you understand who you are and, and who God's and Jesus' kingdom is. Pray for those who are your enemies. Love them in such a way that others won't know whether they're one of your people or one of your enemies. Love them in such a way that, it, that testifies that when God's involved, the line between us and them is erased. I think we have this opportunity today ever more clear. The opportunity to not be one who spreads accusations against others is before us. The opportunity to be patient and let truth and let things settle out is right here among us. The opportunity to say, yes, you might really care for someone and, 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 and uphold someone who does things that are really not, well, good. By the way, you can apply that in if you, to either side if you want to take that. I tried to care, word that carefully. Let us push all that noise aside and let us draw into the center of Christ who recognizes that all are broken, Right? And let's proclaim that the mercy seat of God is for those who are humble and contrite and broken in spirit. 
that God dwells up on the, uh, on the most high, but he also dwells with those who are humble, those who are acknowledging that they are, well, in need. Now, I don't have to tell you all this because I know you have a pastor who tells you all this all the time. And that you are a church who follows that and responds to that. Because, again, I've heard about you all. Your tes- the, the testimony of your faith and your worship and your service and your love for Jesus is known to me. And I give God thanks for that. I was so honored to come here to celebrate Jesus with you all. But in this day, let us just be reminded, we are to be a people of love that is greater than just knowledge. It's easy to say, I hold to the essentials of faith and to not have anything change in our lives, right? It's easy to memorize verses and not have those verses transform who we are. It's easy to put on the award-winning sinner's prayer certificate, or maybe you were in a church that had you memorize enough verses to win a Timothy award or something, some such thing. In case you're wondering, and there's a Christian children's program that has like the Eagle Scout of children's program. You win the Timothy Award. It's because you memorized 6,400 Bible verses. I have a master's degree in Bible, and I don't know that many verses. These eight-year-olds spin circles around me. But you can have all that right and have nothing. And have it be empty. So let us commit to one another again to love to spur one another on to be to find more and more ways to be people who love and i don't mean feel affection but to will and enact goodness and peace and wholeness to everyone within whom we have influence and contact and let us support those who are striving to do at least that in at least a framework a small pin Wherever you find anyone trying to do that in any good way, celebrate that. It doesn't matter what party they're from, what side of town they're from, what race they are, what you need to get the heck away. If they are celebrating that which is good and helping bring healing and wholeness to people, we celebrate that and we uphold that because that is love. Let us be people of love. Would you pray with me? Father, we come to you knowing that these words are so easy to say so easy to say but so hard lord we know that sometimes our our toes get stepped on our egos get bruised lord we know that we want to be received by those around us as the great peacemakers and yet lord you tell us that blessed are the peacemakers who are persecuted so lord give us confidence in christ give us confidence in the resurrection give us confidence in the hope that we have only in jesus And Lord, help us to anchor and fix our eyes on you. That you are faithful to complete what you've started in our lives. And you're able to hold us to to becoming the people of love that you've desired for us all along. We pray this and beg in the name of Jesus. Amen.